Welcome, good evening everyone and welcome to another session of the Beyond Access series. So tonight we have with us back for her triumphant return, Lavinia Mancuso, uh, Executive Director of Everyone Reading, who's gonna talk to us about writing today and the importance of writing. Um, and she has a few tricks up her sleeves uh, to show how uh, demonstrate writing. Um, and as you all know, in the email today to you all, we asked you all to bring with you some paper and a, and a writing utensil, whether that's a pen or a pencil. Lavinia might have an opinion on which one's better. Um, but uh, if you don't have one right now, feel free to take this time to go grab a piece of paper and a pen and pencil while I uh, do the uh, housekeeping announcements. Um, so tonight, as in every night, we're going to be using the Q&A function. Uh, feel free to type in your questions throughout the presentation. Um, we're going to be specifically answering questions to Lavinia's topic of writing and uh, throughout the presentation, but we also have some time set aside towards the end to answer them live over uh, the, the, the stream. Um, we don't have the opportunity to mute or unmute folks' microphones, so apologize for that in advance. Um, but we, are, we will be recording the session and you will all have access to this recording afterwards uh, via our YouTube page. And if you haven't followed our YouTube page, what are you doing? You should be following our YouTube page so you can get all the latest information around Beyond Access. Um, so with all of that housekeeping being done uh, and presumably with you having something to write with and something to write on, I'm gonna turn it over to our presenter for tonight's seat, Lavinia Mancuso. Good evening, Lavinia. Good evening. I am so delighted to be here. Um, as many of you know, I was a first and second grade teacher, and then I was the principal of an elementary school. And I retired from those jobs, but I am still a parent. And I have to tell you that being a parent is much more complex and difficult than any other job. Uh, when I was a principal, one dirty look could stop 550 students in their tracks. That same dirty look at home just got a shrug. So uh, I understand how uh, difficult it is to be a parent. I only had one child, but many of you have several. And I want to encourage you just to be the best parent you can be. Leave, you don't have to be a teacher, you don't have to be a police person, uh, just be a good parent and let the school take care of the instruction. But it's always good to pay attention to what's going on and to be able to give your kid a little encouragement along the way. The reason I am so glad to be here tonight is that um, Everyone Reading has been doing tutoring, uh, very small tutoring programs for third graders for the past several years. And I have noticed to my distress that kids are not uh, printing <clears throat> easily and quickly and legibly. They are crunched up at, like pretzels, they erase and erase and then they lose track of what they're doing. Um, so I thought I would give you uh, some quick tips on just basic manuscript printing. Now, people have been writing for thousands of years, but we are now in 2021 and we have to use technology. So I am going to share a PowerPoint with you. And so I'm going to, I've learned to do this, to share my screen and... Uh, I am going to find my PowerPoint and I'm going to share it with you. And I'm going to play. I learned to do this all recently. There you are. So write it down. The importance of fast, legible printing. Now, I am not the only one who's concerned with poor handwriting. Researchers are telling us that even in college, kids who write slowly or laboriously or don't hold their pencils correctly get very tired and they can't really complete their work. In elementary school, 
sometimes kids who write slowly or um, laboriously and get tired uh, can't show what they really know. And the third study, which was published four years ago, uh, does handwriting instruction have a place in the instructional day? When I was a first grade teacher, it had a big place in the instructional day, but now it's kind of gone. But in typical education language, results indicated a significant positive correlation between academic success and the quality of handwriting. Now, when they talk about the quality of handwriting, they don't mean beauty. They mean legibility and quickness and accuracy. We're not talking about calligraphy. We're not talking about beauty. We're talking about getting the job done. Now, handwriting is like any physical activity. It's like a sport and it must become automatic. Um, we talk about two kinds of memory. There's long-term memory and working memory. You use your working memory to decide what to do, to decide what you want to write. If you want to write a letter uh, or an email, you think about the words you want to say and how you want to say it. You want your writing, your handwriting, to be in long-term memory so that you don't have to think about it. Now, we, many of us have watched the World Series. Those baseball players have their skills stored in their long-term memory. The batter doesn't look at the ball and say, oh, a ball is coming. How do I hold my bat? What do I do? Will I hold it this way, this way? No, all of that is in their long-term memory so that they can focus on just hitting the ball hopefully out of the park. And how did they accomplish that? They had good instruction when they were in a little league. They probably had better instruction in, in junior high school and high school and maybe college. And they have good coaching telling them how to do it well, but also they practice all day long, all year long. They have spring training. They keep practicing even though they are at the top of their game. So the way you become good at something is having correct practice. However, if you have incorrect practice, it's worse than no practice at all. I've told Jose and Ori that a friend of mine is an occupational therapist in rural Maine. And she used to work at the veterans hospital with people who had blown off their fingers. Uh, but now she works through the school system curing problems that were caused by the school system because they force children to use their small muscles when they were very little and they couldn't do it and they develop bad habits and then they have to be cured. So correct practice is so important. Uh, as my friend says, good penmanship begins in the playground where you exercise your gross motor skills and your small motor skills holding onto the swings and or on the rope. And you learn eye-hand coordination and you get strong from running around. You get stamina. And as I said, children who are asked to, early, to write too early develop bad habits, which cause them to write slowly and laboriously and they get tired. First grade is the best time to teach penmanship. That's the way when they do it all over the world. Only here do we want kids to be writing in pre-K. Not a good idea. All right, so good handwriting, and we learn this to over Zoom more than even in class. You have to have good posture. You have to sit up straight. If you're scrunched over, you're going to get tired. You need a hard surface. You can't be writing on the rug or writing in your bed. You can write a little note, a post-it, but for extended writing, you have to have a hard surface. You have to have a good pencil grip. And if you're holding your pencil like this, you're going to get tired. The pencil grip you need is two fingers on the side and one finger on top. And I'll show you how this works later. And then you need somebody to teach you. And I'm going to show you how to do that. 
And then you need excellent models. And one of the things that I um, insist on when I observe classes is that all the signage be in very good penmanship. Uh, the teachers must sign very clearly and legibly. And obviously you need lots and lots of practice. And I believe in dictation because it involves listening, speaking, reading, and writing. And I'm going to show you that. And self-correcting. Uh, there's more research that when the teacher takes the paper home and marks it up and gives it a grade and gives it back to a kid, the kid says, oh, 75. Whereas when a, when a student self-corrects, they remember what, they're, what they did wrong, but more important, they remember what they did right. So this is our alphabet, the Roman alphabet. Very simple, just a bunch of letters and circles, that's it. And the same with uppercase letters, mostly lines, that's it, lines and circles. That we have no accent marks, we have no tildes, we have no circumflexes, we have no celillas, just lines and circles. It's doable. And then we have Arabic numbers. And I believe that writing numbers is e clearly is even more important than uh, even writing letters. Because if you mix up a four and a nine by not closing the top, you will have a very different result. Uh, my son who had very poor handwriting until his coworker at his first job shamed him into good handwriting, now has a job where he has to leave a lot of hand, quick handwritten notes and he has to do a lot of work with budgeting and numbers. And if he were to mix up a one and a seven or a four and a nine, his company would lose a lot of money and he would lose his job. So we really have to be careful with numbers. And we really have to make sure that kids write higher numbers with the commas in the right place, right? The decimals with the uh, with the, the periods in the right place, the decimal points in the right place, and money, look at that decimal point. If you move it one, <clears throat> one place to the left, you've got $2.55. If you move it one place to the right, you have $255. So these small things are very, very important, both for students when they're doing their math, and for adults, <laughs> when they wanna keep their jobs. So I believe that writing letters should be linked to sounds. We have an alphabetic language and why not combine the sounds of English with the letters of English? You're doing it anyway, you know, why not take the time to do both? It's the same amount of time. Also, directionality is essential. And I'm very sad to say that I have seen these third graders in our programs not using the Z formation, writing all over the page. Uh, so we start at the top, unless we have a good reason not to, and we go from left to right, and then we go back to the left and back to the right and back to the left and back to the right. And uh, for some children, that's what goes on at home. For other children who speak Arabic or Hebrew, their parents are reading and writing in the other direction. But it doesn't really matter. In English, we go from left to right and back and forth. And then once the letters are learned, the rules should, have come, out, should come out of writing practice and experience. Capitals are only 5% of the print we will see in life. 95% is lowercase. And so that's where we should focus on teaching our kids handwriting. Punctuation is a function of speech. When you stop, and in England they call it a full stop, you put in a period. When you take a little breath, you put in a comma. 
Letter size is very important. Capitals and many lowercase letters are full space and lowercase letters are often a half space. And we must leave spacing between words. I always say to kids, leave a finger space between your words. Now this seems very simplistic. This is the way I taught in first grade many, many years ago. And lo and behold, all the kids learned how to do it. But I was allowed the time and the materials to get the job done. Uh, there are other strategies. Copying is not a bad thing to do. Accurate copying is very important. You have to be able to copy from the board. You have to be able to copy from the smart board. You have to be able to copy down the instructions that the translator just gave you. If you can't write fast, you cannot write down those phone numbers. And so you have to be able to copy from things you see and copy things you hear. And I talked about comparing your work to the model and self-correcting. Now here's something that I think is very, very important. You never pick up your pencil except for a very good reason. If you never pick up your pencil, you will never reverse letters. And I'll show you how to do that. Uh, and no erasing. Cross it out and write it correctly. There are kids that use erasing as a strategy. First of all, even if they don't, it takes time. And you miss out on what's going on. And secondly, there are kids who have made erasing a strategy to avoid class. They erase, they erase again, they make a hole in their paper, they have to get a new paper, boom, the lesson is over, they are free. And I also believe in timed writing practice, and we'll talk about that if you have time to do that with your um, kid. You just say, okay, copy this, see how fast you can do it or how many words can you write? Any words in, I'm gonna set the timer for 30 seconds. And everything starts with sounds, then you move into words, then sentences and paragraphs. And that's what we're going to do tonight. So everyone can do it. As my friend says in Maine, She's a little embarrassed making so much money correcting the bad habits that were caused by the school system that is paying her so much money. Uh, we have only 26 letters, manageable. We only have 44 to 47 sounds that we have to match up with those letters, manageable. And you don't even know how to read a lot. You don't know how to read at all to do this, to match up your sounds and letters. Hopefully matching up your sounds and letters will lead to good reading, but reading is not a requirement. That's the end, not the beginning. And everyone can do it. Um, I think you'll be getting a copy of this PowerPoint. Here is a little alphabet chart that also tells you where to begin and how to form the letters. I got it off the internet. You can get one off the internet. Just pick the one that you like the best. And that's the end of the PowerPoint. If you would like to get in touch with me, uh, my name is Lavinia Mancuso, and here's my email address. Laura, our administrative assistant, who is also tech support, and um, she does a lot of other recruiting for the tutoring program. And so she's someone to get in touch with. And we also have an information and referral service where a knowledgeable person can answer some questions about IEPs, special ed. Uh, we are not part of the New York City Department of Education, but she has some good insights and she has some good resources. So, and then your special, uh, your DOE resources, Jose and Ori, who are here, can be contacted at these email addresses. So don't hesitate to get in touch. Uh, we are supported by your public funds. And so make good use of your tax dollars by getting in touch. So now I am going to do something that I just recently learned. 
I am going to use a document camera. And so I'm going to stop this share. I'm going to escape and I'm going to turn down this. And now you see my whole face and I'm going to show you how to hold your pen or your pencil or your marker or your paintbrush or your crayon. You hold it two fingers here with a, a third finger on top. So your thumb and your index finger on the side of your writing tool with your finger on top. Then you curl the other fingers around however you want to do it. This is the most efficient way to hold a writing implement. And if you hold it this way, you will get you will not get tired because I'll show you if you hold it this way or this way or this way, um, things will not be as efficient. So hold your pencil or your pen like this and put your finger on top. And now we're going to go, I'm going to share the screen again. Uh, where will I find that share? Hmm. Share screen. And I'm going to share my Elmo with you. Please bear with me. This is a real adventure for an old lady. Okay, I am going to show you how to write the alphabet and then we're going to work on some tricky problems. So, we now I don't particularly like this format with the little dots in between. I think kids should really, and I found this even in first grade, uh, one space is that it's very hard to sustain a big long line. So one space is even better with a whole space for the tall letters and a half a space for the lower K for the short letters. But since I have this, I'm going to use it. So we're just going through the alphabet with A. Remember, now you can say the letter names, but you get more bang for your buck with the sounds because you can't make words out of letter names. You can't say B-A-T and get that. When you say B-A-T, put them together, you get that. So with a, you start on the side, you go around, down. With b, you start at the top, you go around, up to the middle, and around. With k, you start on the side and go around. D, you start on the side, you go up, around, down, d. E, across and around. A little hook and across. You have to pick up your pencil to make a f. But if you notice, I have not picked up my pencil until f. And I'm not going to pick it up again for quite a while. G. Around, down. And I started on the side. <sighs> down, up, and around. Don't pick up your pencil. I. You have to pick up your pencil to put the dot. J, down, all the way down, and a hook. J, k, down, and then quickly, half a space, in and out. You have to pick up your pencil once, not twice. O, just a line. M, down, up, around, up around, never pick up your pencil. N, down, up, around, down. Ah, start on the side and up, around. P, down, below the line, up to the middle, P, around. Qu, start on the side, around, down, up, Ooh. down, around, but not too far. S around and back around. T down and across. 
You have to pick up your pencil. Ah, uh, down, up, and down. Down, around, up, and down. Mm. Whoa. You have to pick up your pencil. Why? Yeah. You have to pick up your pencil or you can make it like this. And zzz, across, back, across. Zzz. Now, I am not lying and I'm not fantasizing. <clears throat> After a few months of this in first grade, your children will be able to write like this. And then with the capitals, I'm only going to do a few because they're so rare. It's down, up, down, and across. Down, up, around, and around. A big version. On the side, around and up. D down, up and around. Never pick up your pencil and you will never make a mistake. Now E, I make like this, but you really, I think, should probably make it like this with picking up your pencil. However, remember, uppercase letters are only 5%. And you have to have a good reason for that. I see kids putting uppercase letters in the middle of words. When they're in first grade, that might be cute. When they're in high school, it's not so cute. So please concentrate on lowercase letters. Now, I am going to talk to you about the big problems. Everybody is crazed about B and D. Pick up your pencil, hold it the right way. Hold it two fingers with one finger on top. B. Down, up to the middle, around. B. D. Around, up to the top, down. D. It's like a forehand and a backhand. They're not in any way alike. This is B, this is D. Now, if your kids start with the line and they don't know where to go, they have to use their working memory to try to decide, do I put the circle over here? Do I put the circle over here? And very often I see kids make it like this. So it doesn't even look like a book or a book. It looks like low. So I am not going to erase that. I am going to cross it out and write it correctly. Book. So let's do that in the air. A book is down, up, and around. Book. A book is, and it's not a duh, it's a duh. Around, up, down. And that's it. If you want to uh, drill your kids on b and d, you can make two little flashcards. And what's this? What's this? Is this a book or a d? What's this? Is this a d? Yes, no. Uh, and then you can also hold them up. Copy this. This is a D. Let's copy it. Okay. B and D. So with numbers, it's very, yes, you can see it. With the zero, we again start on the side and go around. One. Two, you can do it this way, you can do it this way, you can do it this way, but those are the only options. And remember, you don't pick up your pencil. 
Three, don't pick up your pencil. Four, you have to pick up your pencil. Five, the best and most efficient way to do it is like that, down and around, and then pick up your pencil to put something on the top. Some kids do it this way, and that's okay too. They never pick up their pencil. It's probably better. Six, down and around. Seven, you can do it this way. You can do it this way, but you don't do it any, you don't leave a big hole on the top. Eight, I suggest you do it this way, around. It's a little tricky to learn, but some people do it with two little circles like a snowman, but sometimes those circles get detached and you don't have eight, you have two flying circles. Nine, start on the side, around and down. And we're back. Those are the 10 digits. All the other numbers in the world are made up of these 10 digits. We don't have any others. It's the same with our alphabet. All the words in English are made up of those same 26 letters. We don't have any others. Now, I believe it is very important to line up numbers and when you're adding to put them under each other. So let's do 126. And we're going to add that to 431. So if they're lined up, and I would suggest if your children don't line numbers up in columns easily, get graph paper. Then they won't be able not to do it. And if they have trouble fitting into those little boxes, you can get larger graph paper. So let's do this. Six and one is seven. Two and three is five. Four and one is another five. And let's write a million. So we have one million and six zeros. That's why they call it a six figure number. But that's like too hard to look at. So we go one, two, three, comma, one, two, three, comma. And that's how we do that. This is all very simple, very easy to learn, but it requires practice. So I am going to show you how, what I would do with a notebook. And to my great surprise, I have asked children to write their names on a notebook or a piece of paper and they write it at the bottom or they write it in bubble letters up here. You write, you start at the top and you start at the left margin line. And then you go across and back. So uh, now please pick up your pencils or pens. I. Um, actually, you know, when I was a teacher, we always used pencils, but for our tutoring programs, we now use pens so the kids won't be tempted to erase. And when we used to do them in person, we used to have all different colors, sparkly pens. So, I mean, it's much more fun to write with a sparkly pen than to write with, you know, a dumb old pencil. So we are going to practice and I hope you are going to see what I, uh, if you can't see, I'll go back to the dry erase board. So we are going to write the word catnip, but catnip has two parts. The first part is cat and the three sounds are a t. Does yours look like that? If it does, give yourself a check. If it doesn't, cross out the part that doesn't look good. You be the teacher. I always tell kids, you be the teacher. And believe me, when they are the teacher, they are really fussy. They only have the beautiful parts. 
And then we're going to write catnip. Cat, we already have cat. N I P. Catnip, a two syllable word, just sound it out. So if yours looks like that, give yourself a big check. If it doesn't, cross out the part you don't like and write it again. We're going to write a three syllable word. Fantastic. Every time you open your mouth, you have another syllable. Fantastic. Let's write fantastic. Ah, mm. Tas, ah, tick, t, it, k, and I, oh, I don't like that. I'm going to write it this way. A little smaller, that was too big. Fantastic. Now, and I always tell kids, to underline the tricky part or remember the tricky part. Now in English, there are two or three ways to write the k sound. You can write a K, you can write a C, or you can write a CK. In this particular word, it's, a, it's a, only a C. So I tell kids, remember that. And if you have trouble remembering, just put a little line over it. That's the tricky part. I have another tricky word for you that you can sound out. Environment, everybody's talking about environment, but I tell kids you have to over pronounce and believe it or not, environment is actually environment. So let's write that N, uh, A, N, oh, I don't like that, too big. E, N, Vi, Run. Environ, m e n t. Environment. Does your does your word look like that? Is it too big? Is it too little? That is not as beautiful as I could do. And if I were one of my students, they would probably say, "Cross it out. Write it again." Okay. <clears throat> So I think it's very important to overpronounce words when they're spelling, like animal, animal. If you overpronounce words, you will hear all the sounds and you will be able to write them. So let's write a sentence. This is a pretty lame sentence, but <laughs> it, it has three words. Sit with Jill, my friend Jill. Sit with Jill. So what do we need at the beginning of a sentence? We need a capital letter. S-I-T. Sit with Jill. Jill is my friend. That's her name. So we need a capital. J. Are we done? What do we need now? This is my sentence. We need a period. Always ask your kids, did you leave a finger space? And did you start with a capital? And did you end with a period? And if you have a name, did you put a capital letter at the beginning of that name? And that's pretty simple. Now we're going to end, sort of, with a longer sentence. I want you to write, relax. And you don't have to sound it out. We don't want kids to be sounding out all the time. They should learn. They write with, they have to store it in long-term memory. Sit, they write it enough into long-term memory. Jill, maybe they don't know anyone named Jill. So they, have, they might want to sound it out. Also, they might be tempted to write it like this. 
And that is a possibility, but not in this case. That's the way you write, Joe. So now, and I have to tell you the best way to become a good writer and speller and reader is just to read a lot of whatever you like to read. All, this is all the research, just read a lot. Graphic novels, comic books, uh, supermarket circulars, anything, anything, anything. If you read a lot, you will become a better reader and you will also become a better speller and writer because you will be seeing these patterns go by. English has more than a million words, but we still only have 26 letters and we still only have like 250 different spelling patterns. It's manageable. And if you read a lot, it will be manageable. So I want everybody, one more sentence. Everybody write, relax. Start with a capital. And write an exclamation point. That is pretty whack. I'm going to write it better. Re wax. Okay. Any questions? I have one for you, Olivia. So there's a style question in here around capital J. The question is, does the J not have to have the line across the top? I, if you want to put a line across the top, put a line across the top. Why not? If it's big, it will be a capital. Any other questions? So I think, folks, this is your, your opportunity to type in your questions into the Q&A. While, while folks type in additional questions, I have some um, that, that, are, that are coming up. And I think my first question for you, Lavinia, would be, is there such a thing as too soon? when trying to teach your children how to write or get them starting used, used to these letters? Yes, um, actually I'm quoting my friend Margie in Maine. And Margie has gotten so rich on pushing kids to write too early that she, I told you she has horses, dogs and her own lake. <laughs> it's because kids are being forced to write in pre-K. First grade is the time to teach writing. Uh, in pre-K, kids can be doing finger paint, they can be doing Play-Doh, they can be fooling around and writing what they please. It's helpful to always have them um, hold, if, if you want to teach them to hold a pencil like this. But if they can't do that, if they're writing like this, you don't want them writing letters. Because, or if they're scrunched up writing like this, those habits are very, very hard to break. So three and four year olds are not ready. They have chubby little fingers. They, it's hard for them to get, their, uh, to get their hands around this, to get their fingers around this. So six in other countries, children are taught to read and write between the ages of six and eight. And I think that's probably a good time. I mean, kids are going to school for 12 years. You know, give them a chance to develop. We don't want to de develop bad habits. Not only are they bad, but they slow kids down and they make kids tired and they make kids not want to write. And so even if a kid has a brilliant thing to say, if he's writing like this, he'll never be able to get it down on paper. We got some more questions coming in, Lavinia. Um, so someone is writing in, my child is in third grade and his handwriting is so bad. Uh, his writing was great in the until first grade. What would make a child go back from good handwriting to bad handwriting? And I'm gonna add this, what can I do at home to support it? Uh, God only knows. <laughs> I think you should ask your child. <laughs> uh, maybe your child's classmates have 
such terrible handwriting that he wants to go with the group or something, ask your child. Um, maybe he says, I have to write too fast. I have, I have to write sloppy, but really encourage good handwriting. And if he had good handwriting two years ago, it's back in his long-term memory. So try to get it out and with praise, lots of praise. And also you be the teacher, correct yourself, no erasing, cross it out, write as fast as you can, but make it legible. It doesn't have to be beautiful. It just has to be legible. I have met kids, including my son, who had trouble reading his own handwriting back to him. Now, I'm not advocating shame, but it really worked on him, but he was 22 years old. Uh, any others? How do you feel about um, writing drills? Like should, fam should, should parents uh, like try to do some writing drills at home if they're saying there's some penmanship issues? Uh, remember, it the practice has to be correct. Incorrect practice. So if you can do a writing drill and get away with it, uh, go ahead, but make sure that your child is writing correctly and practicing correctly. Um, and, you know, uh, very quick, one minute max, not writing all day, you know, not writing, I must behave a hundred times, uh, <laughs> as was done <laughs> in my student days. Um, quicker is better. Uh, you know, a one minute drill every single day is better than a five minute drill once a week. Yeah, I was wondering, I'm, I'm, as I'm thinking this, Lavinia, I wonder if some, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm thinking back to my childhood and the things that my mom tried to drill into me as a kid, right? So um, there was a time in my life where my mom would like, make me write a word multiple times. So like when I was younger, maybe 10 times, sometimes it was fill the page. And, and at, at, a certain, at a certain point, I just started getting sloppier as I wrote the word more and more, right? And then there were times where my mom would ask me to write one or two sentences about how I felt that day. And I feel like, I feel like if I'm looking back on my personal experience, those are the types of things that my writing was more legible, it was more understanding. So what do you think about those types of different types of things? I think that's a wonderful idea. If your child can write sentences, say, you know, write, write a sentence about what happened to you today. And write, don't worry about spelling. Right now we're looking for at handwriting, you know, and then don't go crazy about spelling. Just say, this is the way it's spelled. And here's underline the tricky part. Um, but I think that's great. And, you know, I'm gonna give you a minute to write or 30 seconds. Kids love to be timed, you know, it's like a race. So I think that's very important. And I mean, you know, uh, from way back when kids had to write their spelling words 10 times, they got into writing them like A, 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 <laughs> you know, B, 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 B. They weren't writing them as words. They were writing them as, you know, columns. So I think that's very important. Um, there is what they call the zone of proximal development. You push your kid just a little bit beyond where he can do it and no more. When things start to deteriorate, stop. Yeah, and I think I think one of the things that I'm reflecting on, that even as, even as an adult, one of the things that um, gets me more into writing, and I think that this could apply to kids as well, is when I write about things that I like versus you know just being told to write something. So uh, one of the things that I picked up as an adult that I didn't really do much as a child is journaling, right, and and writing journaling in, a, in, a, in a, an actual journal. Um, I don't do it anymore, uh, but I should, right? But like, those are the types of things that got me back into handwriting versus typing. So um, I also have another question in here about style, another style question. We went with the line on top of the capital J, but how do you feel about using lines? And is there is there anything that is specific, special around using lines for maybe things like putting a line through a Z or putting a line through a seven? Um, uh Fine, as long as it's legible and it doesn't take up too much time. 
And as long as other people can, you know, read it. So if you put a line through a Z and everybody can read that, that's fine. That's stylistic. That's, and, and the line through the seven is very common. Mm. Uh, so why not? Do you think that there's, is there anything to be said about consistency with these types of things? So like, as you're developing writing, I, I, I am one of those people who sometimes, and I say sometimes, uh, put a line through a seven, right? But I'm not very consistent about it. Sometimes a, a, a seven it doesn't have a line. Sometimes it does. Is there is there anything that family should know about like that kind of consistency, or is it truly just when you're writing a stylistic choice? I think it's a stylistic choice. Basically, what you want is to get this writing into long term memory. So the kid or anybody isn't saying, "Oh, how do I make a seven? Do I make it like this? Do I put a line in it?" because that takes up the time that you should be using to be thinking about the words you want to write on the paper, how you're going to express your thoughts, not, or the, the math that you're planning on solving for the test or solving for your budget. So basically you want all of this writing to get into long-term memory and to be at your fingertips like Serena with her backhand, right? She's not giving that too much thought. It's coming out of her long-term memory. So that's great. Um, any thoughts on if, when is the right time to start teaching students who are English language learners to write? <laughs> Writing, these letters are not connected. These are just symbols on a page. And so I would say don't start at three. But it is very important, especially if you're coming from a language that doesn't use the Roman alphabet, to didact don't assume that all of a sudden uh, kids who read and write in Arabic are going to, you know, immediately know how to read and write uh, the Roman alphabet. So the, le the numbers are pretty much standard around the world. Uh, and so as soon as possible, but not to be for first grade, please. Um, and uh, because they're not, the sounds are just sounds coming out of my mouth. The letters are just symbols. I would connect the letters to those sounds, but basically I am just making sounds. Mm -hmm. And it's your job to turn my sounds into words that you can understand. And uh, Ulysses is making sounds in Spanish that people who speak Spanish can understand. And Max is making sounds in Mandarin that people who speak Mandarin can turn into words. So there's nothing magic about sounds and letters. They are symbols and they're sounds and that's what they are. It's the job of the listener and the reader to make meaning of them. Well, Lavinia, thanks again for spending some time with us and sharing this. I think this is actually very helpful for a lot of families to understand. And really the, the thing that I think was most uh, helpful for families uh, tonight was the, the um, sharing of your handwriting. Um, because I think those are things that as this recording goes, Families can go back to it, rewatch it, and and look at those correct ways of writing these letters and numbers. So I really appreciate that. And I know you're going to be back with us next week, along with Nilsa, to talk to us about the the next progression to writing, which many people might think is cursive. And and I'll gauge your opinion about cursive, <laughs> but um, it really the next the next progression to this is typing. So we're going to talk about typing next week, right? Typing is a marketable skill. So actually is good handwriting. You can write signs. You can, you know, write wedding invitations. Uh, but typing is a marketable skill. In my whole life, I, uh, at junior high school 216, we believed that if we didn't pass the typing test, we wouldn't graduate. So you better believe it, 45 minutes, uh, 45 words a minute, but it has helped me to get summer jobs. It has helped me to 
write term papers. It has helped me to write to email. It has helped me to write grant proposals, to write up mm. observations of teachers when I was a principal. Typing is an essential skill and we must teach kids to do it. You don't do it with your thumbs. So on that note, see you next week. And it's always a pleasure. I admire you. <clears throat> my son is now 33 and he thinks he's my parent. He always says, mom, you should need so many sweets. Uh, parenting is not easy, but it's enjoyable. <laughs> Go for it. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Lavinia. And thank you to everyone who joined and we will see you all next week. Have a wonderful week, everyone.